Thanks for taking uh, the call and having a conversation, Destiny. Yeah, thanks for having me. Or I guess thanks for joining me, I should say. <laughs> um, real quick, just to cover a couple of things. Um, so since I'm broadcasting, don't give any like addresses or phone numbers if you feel the need to say that or anything. Um, nothing you wouldn't okay. want broadcasted to anybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Sure. So, um, so my name's uh, Gordon Menzies. I'm an economics professor. Um, I should just say, uh, in case I drop out, it's not that I'm hanging out. I'm not hanging up on you. I'm calling from a very old building in Oxford University, and um, it's not very internet friendly. So, uh, so uh, just just to let you know that. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> I'm an economics professor. I'm here on study leave. And, um, yeah, I, I had an intern last year who was helping me with finalising a book I'm publishing called mm -hmm. Western Fundamentalism. And um, she told me about you and told me about some of your streaming. So I, I had a look at it and I found it really interesting. Um, a couple of things I liked uh, was that, um, uh, first of all, it seemed like you were having conversations with people which were long enough to really tease out issues and I, I get incredibly frustrated with, you know, the kind of um, condensing everything into a tweet uh, world that we live in. So I really like that. And um, I also really like the fact that um, you seem to be talking about uh, things in a different way to what I'm hearing politics and economics and stuff talked about. Mm -hmm. So if I can just explain that, um, years ago I was here as a graduate student and I went along to the Oxford Union, which is the debating society, and I got really bored with the debates. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that everybody, um, they just seemed so superficial. And so I, I went to one of the leaders and said I found the debate superficial. And he said, everyone who debates here, is unaware of their basic assumptions. They uncritically believe in democracy, market economics, and sexual freedom. And so they're always just scrape, scraping the surface of issues because they don't really think very deeply. And so I like the way that um, you seem to talk about contemporary issues, but you seem to relate it to worldviews as well. So, well, that's kind of kind of interesting for me. Okay, cool. Um, what exactly, so... <clears throat> I know that um, when she connected us, she had a couple things that she wanted to talk about uh, that, that she wanted that you were interested in discussing today. Sure. So, um, so I can talk. I mean, I'm an economics professor, so I'm happy to talk about mm -hmm. economics. I'm also happy to talk about, um, uh, I guess, uh, relationship commodification. Um, I'm interested in talking about religion. Um, I, I might have some different ideas with you about some of those issues, but, um, yeah. Um, did you want to suggest something in particular or should I, should I suggest something? Um, yeah, well, actually I'm curious just so we understand when you say you're an econ professor, um, like what was your yeah. like dissertation on, or what is your like kind of like feel, what is your specialty or is it just like a broad thing? It's pretty broad. Um, so my dissertation while I was here was on, um, was on the Asian financial crisis, but since then, I've gotten ish. I've gotten really interested in the influence of economics on culture, on, on people's ethics, and and really on on the way that they see life. Um, so, uh, you might know this, but both um, both from the right and from the left, there are really um, influential thinkers who kind of think of economics as sort of shaping social life. So, from the left, you've got a guy like Marx, and from the right, you've got a guy called Gary Becker who sort of um, likes to see everything in society in terms of economic exchanges. So mm -hmm. both of those people are very influential. So I'm kind of interested in all that stuff. Okay. Interested in the economics on culture. Gotcha. Um, well, I guess um, I guess usually when I bring people on, it's usually it's because they disagree heavily with something I've said. Um, I don't know Steven how much of my stuff you, you've Man, watched. Also, um, uh -oh, so I guess no we can, yeah, we can either start with something that you feel like I said that you disagree with, um, and then we can kind of go from there, or you can just bring up a topic that you're really interested. I guess we can go from there. Either one. Okay. All right. Well, let, let me start with something that I, um, which is which is really interesting to me, which is that 
Um, when I talk about the influence of economics on culture, mm -hmm. I often talk about how um, it can commodify, having markets and too many things can commodify relationships and commodify the way we see people. Sure. Um, but one thing that I heard on one of your um, your streams indicated that that that's actually not something that concerns you. So I'm not sure I'm not sure where I'll I'll end up with that. But let me let me try anyway. Yeah, go for it. Um, so you might know about um, a famous study of an Israeli creche where people were having trouble with parents turning up late for their kids. Um, have you heard this story? I haven't. But go for it. Hit me up. Oh, okay. That's, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So there was a daycare center where people were turning up late uh, to pick up their kids. And so they must have had an economist on staff. So they said, look, we'll solve this. Mm -hmm. We'll put on a fine for people turning up late. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what would you expect to happen then? You'd expect that people would not like the fine and so they wouldn't turn up late anymore. But what they actually found was that more people turned up late. Now, the reason that the um, the reason that the, the um, authors of the study gave for why this was happening is was because the appearance of a price switched people from a moral frame of reference to a commercial frame of reference. Sure. So before, before the price was there, people thought, hey, turning up late is, is kind of a bad thing to do. I'm inconveniencing people. But now I turning up late it. is only worth, you know, $20 or whatever. So now exactly. it's like, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So if my, if my wage is more than 20 bucks an hour, I got, I've got this babysitting so I can just pay for it and turn up late. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so the idea is that um, having prices involved, having finances involved changes things from a, a moral frame to a commercial frame. And you get the same thing, actually, um, Destiny, in, um, in the deregulation of the financial sector. So as soon as um, people become very, very commercially driven, mm -hmm. then there's a phenomena that people sometimes can look at everything in terms of cost-benefit analysis. So everything that I do, what are the pluses, what are the minuses, I'll sort of balance them and make up my mind. Um, now, that can not go so well if you're thinking about things like, should I tell my client the truth? You can say, well, what are the pluses? What are the minuses? And if you think in that kind of a way, you'll, you'll end up balancing it all and telling them what we might call the, is the optimal amount of truth from your point of view, mm -hmm. which mightn't be the optimal amount of truth from their point of view. And so in, in both these instances, the kind of appearance of a financial frame or a financial way of thinking just changes the way that um, just switches people from a moral frame to a kind of cost benefit frame. Sure. Okay. So the real interesting question, the really interesting question for me is what about things that don't have an actual price tag, but for which you can still have a kind of commercial feel about them? What about what about markets where there are, if you like, implicit prices or or yeah, they just feel like markets. So an interesting question is whether, uh, say, the, the sexual revolution has really been a deregulation of the marriage market. Mm -hmm. And so um, whether people now think of relationships in terms of a cost-benefit analysis. So, yeah, that's, that's something. Now, I, I think I am concerned about that, but, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that that would be something that worries you, but I'm interested to hear what you say about that. Um, I guess, so I would think of two, well, there's a lot of, okay, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, okay, I'm just going to ramble for a second. Um, the first thing that I would think about in terms of like, um, have, have we switched things to a cost-benefit analysis um, by, I, I guess, via the, the route of the sexual revolution? Um, I, I guess the first thing I would think of is that like, it seems like we're always doing some sort of cost-benefit analysis, but it's not always done in dollars. Um, would be the first thing I would think of. Um, I, I'm sure you agree with this. I'm just trying to formalize this. So, for instance, like the people leaving their kids at school, um, their cost benefit might be like the benefit is I could just stay at work a little bit longer, and the cost is I either appear as a worse parent or I leave my child at school a little bit longer. Um, and that in, in that transaction, um, it's generally not worth it to work a little bit more to let down your kid. Um, but when you start tying dollars into it, it's easier to look at a dollar thing. You're not really thinking about letting your kid down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when we're looking at like cost benefit analysis for relationships, um, 
I'm sure there was some cost benefit analysis before. There must have been um, the the idea of like if I get married, it means that you know I'm committing myself to a certain type of lifestyle. Um, for women, it often meant that they had to commit themselves to a certain number of children. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess the question is whether or not switching to to like a a, a different type of um, cost benefit. I guess analysis of relationships is beneficial or, or detrimental to society or people. Um, and then the second thing is, I guess, I, I'm, I, one thing I don't fully understand is when you say via the sexual revolution, what, what exactly do you mean by that? That like the, the casual way that we view sex has caused people to view relationships in a different way that's caused us to adopt a different type of cost benefit analysis when looking at them? Or what exactly do you mean when you say that? Um, okay. That's a great question. So, um, um, what I mean by that is that um, in the so if you think of a if you think of a marriage relationship as kind of like a um, a restriction on people's freedom, mm-hmm. um, if you were thinking about it economically, which I wouldn't recommend, sure, um, yeah. you might you might think of it as a monopoly, and economists generally like deregulating monopolies. Um, so I guess you could view the sexual revolution as a kind of deregulation the marriage monopoly so that you can get um, all the things that marriage provides from from multiple people. Um, and that implies, you know, greater instability in, in relationships. And so I suppose that's what I fundamentally mean. An increase in sexual partnerships, greater instability in relationships, more impermanence, um, and a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of market vibe. We're always on the lookout Sorry to sound crass for the best deal. Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure I agreed with what you said about cost-benefit analysis. You said you're always doing cost-benefit analysis. What about people that sometimes just screen something off from their thinking? They just say, oh, no, I don't do that or I won't do that. Um, maybe it sounds a little reductive at this point, but but I guess, I guess my response would be that there are some costs that people are like um, – the cost is like infinity. So for instance, like we do a cost benefit analysis when we decide whether or not we want to, um, you know, leave our kid at school forever. Well, that the idea of like abandoning your child for a lot of people is inconceivable. So that, that cost is just like infinitely bad. We would never really consider that in lieu of most benefits, I would imagine. Um, I, I guess that is a little bit reductive because yeah. um, it's sort of the, the feel of cost benefit analysis is sort of weighing things up. So when you say there's an infinite cost, there really isn't any weighing. But yeah, sure. Yeah, I guess, I guess you can make it. I guess you can use that language. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure we're on the same page. Um, okay. So I've never um, usually when I have these conversations, I've usually thought about these things a million times over. I've I've never heard this idea before. So let me talk through this for a second. Okay. Just so I can understand exactly what we're saying. Um, okay. So if we're viewing um, marriages through like a, like an, an economic lens. Um, before we were able to enter a contract with a firm to get um, some sort of deal that required them to have an exclusive contract with us. So in the case of marriage, we're getting things like sex, companionship, um, maybe children, I don't know. We'll, we'll say sex and companionship um, via by, by way of like an exclusive contract. Um, now you're saying that with the deregulation of the market, we've essentially made those contracts not um, 100% like uh, mandatory for those types of relationships, which has caused people to engage in contracts with dozens of firms um, because they're able to get those benefits outside of a, a monopolistic contract with a single firm. And you're, all right, it sounds like you're going to make the argument or you believe that that's leading to negative effects in society that, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, is that, is that an okay summary of where we're at right now? Yeah, that's right. And, and look, I have mixed feelings about it because, um, I do understand that one of the things about a monopoly, let's talk commercially for a second, one of the things about a monopoly is that the monopolist can um, give their customers a hard time, raise prices and so on and and exploit them. And I do understand that uh, tragically it is true that in in some and many marriages that um, the exclusive relationship that people have has been exploited and has been an opportunity for, for people to do bad stuff. Um, and so there's a kind of compassionate argument that some people would have for, you know, freeing up the marriage monopoly. But yes, you, what you've described is mm-hmm. is kind of what it means to deregulate um, marriage. Sure. Mm. I imagine um, <laughs> we're 
stretching this analogy beyond uh, beyond all recognition. But if we were to continue with the economic analysis, though, we could argue that in some ways monopolies are bad because you can exploit customers. But in other ways, um, where, say, like a barrier to entry is inordinately high, like, say, like duplicate infrastructure for social uh, mm -hmm. projects, right, that you would want monopolies here. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't want to create like 52 different like pipe systems or plumbing systems for different um, utility providers in a city because, mm -hmm. yeah, reduplicating that infrastructure is incredibly expensive and, and probably won't happen. Um, and maybe Maybe we could argue in the same with relationships that laying down the infrastructure for a successful relationship across many, many, many people either becomes impossible or, or devalues all of it such to the point that it's not really worthwhile to pursue in the same way that it would in a, mon in a monopolistic fashion, maybe, is kind of where we're headed, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, that's not a bad, that's not a bad thought. Um, I guess to make it more marriage specific, I suppose you could say with children mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the the thinking of the children as parties to the contract as as people that are just written in and don't have any power, mm -hmm. I guess if you have a really unstable marriage contract, then they get hurt by that as well. Sure. Um, does something like, um, so I still haven't asked you what like moral framework we're looking at this through in terms of like what kind of moral judgments we're making here. Um, if I just ask the question, let's assume that we live in a world where birth control use is perfect, where people are never having children outside of uh, marriage. Would you consider these types of relationships to still be detrimental to society? Or are you mainly focused on like the, the, uh, the, the breaking up of like family units because children are born out of wedlock? And it's just let me try and understand that. I think that's a really good question. I've just got to grasp it all. Sure. Why did you say the um, birth control just applied outside of marriage? Why do we wait? What, can you ask that again? Did you say the thought experiment was that um, that there's perfect birth control outside of marriage? Yeah. So let, that, let's assume no children are born out of wedlock. Do you think still think that yeah. people engaging in multiple sexual relationships and everything is still a negative, or are you mainly focus on? Married? While they're married. Um, oh no, no. What? Well, well, just in general, not not while they're married, not necessarily cheating or anything like that. Just. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, yeah, I would. Um, so you're asking me what moral framework I'm coming from. I'm I'm a Christian, so um, so I would regard the purposes of marriage as not just um, procreation, having kids, but also I'd regard the the um, experience of marriage and a faithful marriage as being something that's morally valuable. Gotcha. Um, if you come up against somebody who has a moral system that is contrary to yours or that doesn't view it in the same way, do you feel like you can make um, com um, compulsions of that person to adhere to this type of framework, like saying that like having sex outside of marriage, for instance, is like a bad thing? Or do you kind of have to fall back on your, your Christian convictions for this argument? Um, I'm not someone who thinks that if something's wrong, it should be legalized necessarily. I'm not talking so, necessarily like legal. I'm just saying in terms of like prescriptions for how people ought to act in society. I'm not sure what I, I'm, not, I'm just, help me understand what you mean by compulsion if we're not talking about law. Um, like, well, like, like what people, like, um, what would be the best course of action for people? Um, so like, for instance, it, it almost sounds like we're saying here, even if you think you want to have multiple sexual partners, you ought not to do that because it would be better for... What reasons besides moral ones? I guess is what I'm thinking of. Um, besides moral ones, now that's going to be a hard question to answer. Like, let's say, for instance, a guy wanted to. Um, a guy is like, you know, I could get married at 23. I have the opportunity to, but I would rather just, um, you know, go out and seek out a lot of sexual relationships. Um, is there some sort of like empirical foundation that we can build an argument against this person's lifestyle or does it come back to like, well, this is an immoral way to engage with sexual activity? Okay. Well, let me, let me be, um, mm -hmm. um, very, uh, very honest with you. Sure. It's probably, probably a bit of both and probably the way that you interpret evidence is influenced by your moral framework or your basic beliefs about life. Mm -hmm. So. There is some evidence that people who um, have a fairly free sexual lifestyle can have difficulties later in marriage. Um, it's the evidence that I've seen mainly relates to people in their teenage years or to uh, having a lower probability of a successful marriage if you cohabit with more than one person before you marry. Mm -hmm. So there is some evidence like that. Um, but I guess um, the way you interpret that and what weight you give to it really depends upon your worldview um yeah and what do you think the purpose of sex is gotcha um 
Okay, yeah. Um, I, I think that there are like, um, uh, I, I agree with you that there are different moral frameworks through which we can view uh, human behavior, I guess. Um, I, I would say that there are some like foundational things that 99% of people agree with. Um, so for instance, if I could demonstrate that having more than 10 sexual partners would lead you to die when you're 25, most people would be like, oh yeah, well that we should never do that. You know, even if they don't buy into the other moral arguments. Um, the, mm -hmm. the idea of like having multiple relationships and whether or not that impacts your ability to have a steady, um, positive relationship later in life, um, that, that would be like the type of thing that I would point to for like a non-Christian to be like, hey, maybe you ought to consider this because it could have this detrimental impact down the road that nobody really wants, regardless of your moral yeah. work, sure. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I mean, the way the point at which this conversation started was I was mm -hmm. saying that I don't actually agree with taking economic thinking into our relationship areas. Um, so, yeah, I I don't regard uh, marriage as a monopoly to be deregulated. Sure. Um, but I think that's I think that is one of the things that's happened uh, as a result of the as a result of the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, um, what moral framework would you have with regard to these issues? Um. I, I guess it like um, the the way that I view it is that like people gen I think there's like a common set of things that people try to fill in their lives. Um, so for instance, people like to have hobbies. People like to have. Um, are you familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, that like to, to some extent that like, you know, obviously we need our food, we need our shelter, we need all of that. Um, we also need healthy relationships, either with our family members or our friends. We probably want a job that gives us some kind of fulfillment. Um, I, I basically look at these kind of like broad things that most people want. And then when I think of like um, government policy or maybe even moral prescription, I try to think, you know, what activities could humans engage in that maximize the most of these for the most amount of people is, is generally the point of view that I look at things with. Yeah. Okay. So is it a kind of... Um... Um, have you heard of utilitarianism? Um, yeah, it's yeah. So it's normatively, maximizing, it, what maximizing the maximizing the amount of pleasure minus pain for everybody. Yeah, basically, yeah. No, normatively, that would be my position. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are you? Uh, uh, well, I, I think I, I think I've heard you say in other streams that you are an atheist. Is that right? Um, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, look, I guess, I guess it's difficult. I guess there'll be a lot of things that people who are Christians and atheists or people of other religions might agree on in the hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess there'll be things. I guess there'll be things that they won't. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, hmm, I suppose it then comes back to which worldview is correct, because that's got to make a difference for. For how you look at these kinds of things yeah although that's um yeah the i try to i try to appeal to the broad base preferences that i think that most people have um mm. because when it when it gets into like who has the correct worldview you're essentially getting to like arguing one religion against another um now i mean if you're a very strong christian obviously you feel like that's an argument that can be won but i mean of course a strong muslim a strong jewish person a strong everybody feels like they have very strong arguments there um but I, but i feel like even amongst like all of these religions um if i were to be an atheist which i am right i would say that all of these religions um that make these types of claims about what we ought to do are probably hinting at some deeper uh human desire so for instance it's probably not a coincidence that a lot of people advocate for some type of family unit it seems like we do well when we're organized organized in families and when we all get along with each other in society and healthily communicate with each other. Like these are broad things that I think you could appeal to for most people, even without like a religious foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it depends a lot on whether you, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a bunch, there are a bunch of questions, which are all interesting questions. One set of questions is how do we all get together in a, how do we all get along together in a society when we've got different views? Yeah. And another set of questions is, you know, what do you think life is actually about? What mm -hmm. kind of a view of life do you form? Um, and I think that, um, I mean, from a Christian point of view, I think that God allows people freedom uh, to make bad choices. And so I have to allow a measure of people. I have to, I have to be in favour of some of that. I have to be in favour of allowing people freedom to make bad choices. I have to be in favour of, people sometimes saying things which I think are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of my recipe for how um, 
I live in the society and people get on together. Sure. So um, I'm not sure we're disagreeing on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's not much room to. I can't. <laughs> Let's start debating religion or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I, I was raised um, very Catholic. I went to, uh, I don't know what b- flavor of Christianity you are, but I went to like a Catholic grade school. I went to a Jesuit high school, so I'm pretty familiar with a lot of the religious teachings. Um, I think as long as you're pretty chill about it, I, like I don't think. M- I feel like most Christian teachings are probably going to align with most like decent views of how a society ought to operate. So I don't think there are too many insane prescriptions you get out of Christianity that most people are going to be like, oh, that's horrible. Um, Aside from maybe, I guess, sexuality, if we're talking about how restrictive we ought to be when we consider how sexually promiscuous we are. I'm curious when you said you had a very Catholic upbringing, what's a very Catholic upbringing? Um, well, I, like I went to 12 years of Catholic education, I guess. I would consider that to be fairly Catholic. I, I don't know. I know people that grew up Catholic that didn't go to a private school. But... Okay. And did you uh, did you believe it at any stage? Um, yeah, for sure. When I was growing up. Yeah. Up until I was about, I'd say probably 16, 17. Okay. Good. I'm, I'm curious. Um, what, what changed? Um, I feel like when... Um, hmm. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. Well, I can answer it. It's hard to answer questions like this when someone else still believes things you didn't believe without sounding like you're, <laughs> without sounding like you're being very arrogant about it. Um, I, I guess like the way that I would view it is that like um, it, it felt to me that um, after a certain level of scrutiny, a lot of the ideas of Christianity just don't seem to hold up. Um, was kind of the problem that I ran into, or rather I was unsatisfied with the answers being provided, um, and it felt like looking at things through a Catholic lens gave me a more distorted view of the world than looking at things through a non-theistic lens, I guess is what I is how I felt. I mean, we can agree that we both think each other are fundamentally deluded. That's all right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. A non-theistic lens. So so atheism is kind of the absence of something, but, you know, it's defined negatively you don't want, in terms of what you don't believe. What um, I'm curious what a non... I mean, there are many different non-theistic lenses. There's Marxism. There's all sorts of things. Uh, what kind of a non-theistic lens did you end up with? Um, I, so I guess like philosophically, I think it winds up somewhere around like existentialism. Um, I, I don't, I don't, um, but, but in terms of like Marxism or something, I don't think I have like a, I don't think I have like a framework like that necessarily. Um, I, I look at like theism or atheism as just like a statement of your belief on, on the existence of a God. And I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the existence of a higher power. Um, so that I, I, yeah, I guess I don't know if I necessarily am required to adopt a, a more formal framework aside from just making a statement on my belief in a higher power. I think. Okay. Oh well, you know, you're not required to. I. Um, it just seems sort of inevitable that people uh, to get along in life when they come up with choices, they have to live as though certain things are true or or not true. Sure. Um, so um, yeah, look, I, I actually. You know, if I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't be another religion. I think I'd be an atheist. I've always felt the force of athe- atheism as a worldview, and I can really understand it because I've I've had you know quite a scientific training, and I do understand the appeal of a very simple, um, a kind of simple view, uh, supposedly based on science of people. So I, I do understand atheism pretty mm-hmm. well. I would, I would, um, to to further record, <laughs> um, I would reject the characterization that um, atheists leads to to a more simple view of people. I mean, it feels like religious thinking can sometimes get you to a more simple view of people as well, right? That I would argue that something like being able to view a person, for instance, as good or evil, gives you a more simple view of a person than the unfortunate intricacy or nuance that is involved in analyzing whether a person is, you know, a good character or a bad character in society. Okay. Um... Let me just think about that for a second. Mm-hmm. When I said that um, it's a simpler view, my experience of working in the social sciences is that um, people who have a particular discipline, like psychology or economics, tend to uh, reduce the human person to something within their discipline with their theories. Yeah, and I find um, I find theism is kind of more rich and complex than that. Now, maybe you 
have a form of atheism which isn't like that. Mm -hmm. And that right because you said you didn't have a particular a particular um, style of atheism or a particular like you said you weren't a Marxist or something. Sure. So maybe, maybe things are a bit different for you. Um, so that is a view that of what you just said that I can appreciate one million percent. Um, I do not like it. Are you familiar with the term? Have you ever heard the term scientism? Yes, I have. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not in, I don't, I think it's really, really, really stupid um, when, when people that study the sciences either pretend that science can answer questions about morality or purpose in life. Um, and I also think it's really stupid when somebody has a particular discipline and they think that they can use that one discipline to view everything in the world. Um, so maybe an economist is, is trying to, to draw supply and demand curves for all sexual relationships and explain human behavior through that. Or maybe an evolutionary biologist thinks that they can use evolutionary biology to explain every single type of like human interaction. Um, I'm very much against, if you're trying to say that those views are simple compared to a religious one, I would absolutely agree 100%. Um, I think that when analyzing human behavior, I think taking like multidisciplinary approaches is absolutely paramount. If you're not doing that, then you're doing something that's you're doing a disservice to to so much um, by trying to analyze all human behavior through one particular discipline. I, I would agree with that for sure. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, that that's that is exactly what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I see. I see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, I have like a. I've got like an okay interest in philosophy, and I see a lot of that from people that are heavy into science. That scientism idea that I can use like a a beaker to measure every single facet of human experience and existence, and it's like oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's your definition of science? I'm curious about that. Um, my definition of science. Um, yeah. I, I guess like broadly speaking, to me, science is just like a formal process by which we investigate the world. I guess it's like very, very broadly. Um, and then more specifically, I guess it's just like, it's like, um, it's finding pieces of information that are testable that we can use to make predictions about the world. Okay. Okay. Well, for, for the record, um, <laughs> since you corrected something a moment ago, sure. um, so I, my, my informal definition of science would be the use of logic and evidence to, um, to pursue truth sure. together. Um, and for the record, I think that some religious views are scientific in that sense. I think they do use logic and they do use evidence. Um, so I wouldn't want to make too sharp a distinction between science and religion. Yeah, of course. Well, I think you, you would have to if you're religious, right? Um, any definition that I give of science um, that's broad enough should, like any religious person should hear that and think, well, yeah, of course. Like I would argue that my religious view is scientific as well, that different types of um, moral lessons that you get um, out of the Bible are going to be predictive of how people act in the future or make accurate analyses of, you know, the world for sure. I would, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, the, yeah, mm -hmm. I meant that slightly differently. I mean, I'm thinking as or, a Christian, I'm, I'm thinking of um, uh, say the historical evidence of Jesus, which is a, I think a very good case for the veracity of Christianity. Oh, okay. um, yeah, that's that's more what I was thinking. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, gotcha. Go ahead. So, uh, can I go back to something else I'm interested in? And I hear you talk a lot about politics. Yeah, go for it. Um, what do you like about democracy? What do you think its strengths and weaknesses are? Um, the strength of democracies. Um, the, what is the strength of a democracy? Oof. Um, I mean, it would seem that um, democracies are good. Oh, man. I'm not a big fan of democracy, so this is a really hard one for me. i got to have to think for a second. <laughs> um, really? That's exciting. Tell yeah. me more. Because um, I'm trying to think of strengths of democracy, but I don't know if there are strengths of democracies or if there are strengths of, like, the American yeah, democracy. I really like this. Sorry for interrupting. I yeah. really like this because for most people, mm -hmm. if you talk about democracy – they just bring out Winston Churchill's quote, it's the worst system except every every other system. And that's kind of like a shutdown comment because you're not allowed to talk anymore. So I'm yeah. really interested. Keep um, going. Why don't you why aren't you a fan of democracy? Um so I think democracy is um, okay, I'm going to talk about democracy in, in regards to the United States, um, because I know there are a lot of different types of democratic systems. So in the United States, we elect a system of representatives, and then those people vote on legislation for us. So for pros and cons of democracy in the U.S., some of the pros are that, broadly speaking, the will of the people are represented. It's somewhat resistant to authoritarianism or totalitarianism. Um, Single-party rule doesn't seem to be as effective in democratic systems, although I'm pretty sure Nazi Germany started um, from... Uh, democratic elections. Um, so um, 
I guess it's it's a little bit slower to move, so you don't see radical shifts in government that dramatically change things over the course of one or two administrations. Um, and yeah, I, I think broadly speaking, those are kind of the things that I point to that are probably good about democracy. Um, the the bad the negative aspects of democracy for today, I would say, are that like the problems that we're facing in society are incredibly complicated and require incredibly complicated solutions. That um, to bring this back to what you said in the beginning, that don't boil down to one or two neatly wrapped talking points. You know, if we want to have a, an intelligent conversation about climate change, even if we agree that climate change is real, how we actually address those problems is very fucking complicated. And I don't think the average person is anywhere near informed enough to have a good vote on any of these issues. Um, I think that when people vote they typically have one or two issues in mind they don't even have a good understanding of those issues um, and in that way democratic systems kind of break down in terms of picking what i would say are the best solutions for a society as opposed to say like um either like a fascist state or a totalitarian or authoritarian one uh, like say like china who they can act like very quickly and very decisively in a very unified manner against problems although they run the risk like of they have on, like they have on climate change they've done a dramatic yeah for sure yeah mm-hmm Although those people run the risk, those governments run the risk of oppressing their societies, of committing genocides, like China is doing right now against the Uyghurs. Um, so there's there's like pros and cons to a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, sometimes people try and strike a compromise so that there are some things, some decisions are taken out of the democratic process, like the judicial system or central banking. I used to be a central banker, mm-hmm. and these are given to policy elites to make decisions and not generally voted on so that's the sort of compromise that people try and use for sure yeah yeah okay okay um yeah so so when i think about democracy i think the thing that i really like about it is that a small group of people can't oppress a large majority of people can i really like that uh can't can't because the the voting power so if a if a small elite tries to sort of oppress an entire population, you just can't get away with that in democracy because you get voted out. Generally, yeah. Um, generally, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, imperfectly, you know, you can manipulate a population and so on, but it's pretty, it's harder to do that than if yeah. it's a dictator. Well, yeah, the reason why I'm trying to be so careful is because like, because anything that I say, videos, people will talk about in the future, because like, obviously we saw like the subjugation of women under democratic systems for a long time, so because they couldn't vote. So if you're able to restrict certain populations from voting, those people can be oppressed in a democratic system. Although we could no true Scotsman that and say, well, that's not a real democratic system, but yeah, I'm just trying to be really careful about everything I say. Sorry if it sounds like I'm overqualifying everything, but yeah. No, that's all right. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, that's, that's the Weak, that's a weakness of democracy because it it's it's the voters that get taken into account and if mm-hmm. if you don't have coverage for women then they don't get into, taken into account interesting question is whether children now would vote for the kind of relational landscape that we have if they had the power to vote mm-hmm. so would would children vote for the sexual revolution i guess is a question worth asking because um... they're not Probably not. When you say children, can you give me an age range there? Oh well, well, I'm not suggesting that children should vote. Just want to make that clear. I know it's Im- impractical. Yeah, but I'm just saying that they are people that are disenfranchised because they don't have the right to vote. Well, yeah, that's what um, that's um, I'll be careful to know that disenfranchisement isn't necessarily bad, which I'm sure you agree with, right? A one year old probably shouldn't be able to vote. Um, I, I, the only reason I ask the age range is because I imagine diff- different people are going to be motivated to respond to this question in different ways based on how old they are. So, for instance, somebody that's like two years old to eight years old, if we could enter their mind and figure out what their true preference was, probably not in favor of the sexual revolution, just because it means either less time with their parents or the potential for less of a, of a family structure, maybe. Um, somebody that's maybe um, 14 to 18 might be more in favor of the sexual revolution because they're in high school. They don't attach much value to relationships in terms of like long term marriages. So they just want to be able to, um, you know, have more fun as a teenager without thinking about the uh, consequences or whatever. Um, so it would really depend on the age range there, um, I would imagine. Yeah, OK, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair comment. Um, yeah. So. So one of the things that I so. When it comes to democracy, one of the things people say about it is that, um, you know, power corrupts. And so democracy, because it generally spreads around power compared to a dictatorship, is is sort of say it, it guards the leaders from moral ruin and so leads to good government and moral progress. But I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I think power can corrupt, but I also think power can reveal as well. And yeah, so I, I like think that, that more, that power reveals, not necessarily corrupts, I think, yeah. 
but I have a very low opinion of you. I'm very cynical, so <laughs> but yeah, okay. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think any of us, if we're put into a position where every decision we make is really weighty and people are going to get hurt or or not as a result of it, I mean, all of our faults would would come out for sure. I actually think politicians are victims of um, what I call centrifugal vilification. You know how the centrifuge works? It sort of pushes everything out to the edge. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that ordinary people sometimes uh, blame politicians for things that are really, I guess, I guess group evil, group evils in society where people want things that are, you can't reconcile them and then those decisions filter up to politicians who have to make decisions and then people despise them for it. I, so I'm, I'm a bit sorry for politicians, actually. Sure. I guess depending on what we're looking at, I can almost maybe agree. <laughs> almost maybe. Almost maybe. I think there's a lot of... Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, yeah. Uh, let me think of something else we can talk about. I don't know. Have you got any, anything else you want to talk about in economics? Um, talk about an economics, um, my, (laughs) um, sure. Here, I'll give you a little spiel. Um, I fought a lot with leftists over the past, like, um, six months. That's been very aggravating for me. Um, I'll just, I'll talk for a second and then you can tell me what what your general thoughts are on this, I guess. Um, one big problem that I have when I'm making economic descriptions, um, so figuring out, you know, like what's happening or economic prescriptions, figuring out what we should do, um, in, in America I, I run into a lot of people that are incapable of separating um, economic description from like moral statements. Um, so, mm. for instance, like, um, are, are you familiar with like rent control as a policy? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. So, like, um, maybe we'll disagree on the descriptive part here. So, everything that I've seen about rent control is, is it's pretty bad. Um, it, it doesn't really favor the people that we would like it to favor. Um, it causes a lot of down the road negative impacts to people that we would like to not feel those negative impacts. Um, and that it just, it creates a lot of damage in these markets in, in ways that is, is not, it's not comporting with our intended outcome of providing lower cost housing to middle or lower class citizens. Um, now, whenever I make a statement like that, whenever I see something like, it seems like rent control isn't very effective, I run into a lot of people that are like, oh, you want landlords to kill all poor people. Oh, you think that it's good that people can't afford houses. Oh, that it seems like people are very incapable of separating out like an economic description versus um, like some moral statement attached to it. Like I might say something like a CEO is worth way more money than you know somebody that works at a cashier now that's not to say that that person has more human value but people hear that people like oh so you think a ceo is worth 100 of your mom like you think that they're that much more important to society it's like well no but like in terms of like economic value like that seems to be the case um that's an issue that i've been running into a lot um i I guess in my conversations with left-leaning people over the past six months has been very frustrating to me all right go for it Okay. Um, well, not knowing the U.S. economy uh, that well, I'm a little hesitant to to comment on the accuracy of your description. Sure, that's okay. But but in general, rent controls can have the opposite effect of what what's intended. So they can actually lead to a reduction in the availability of accommodation for poor people. Yeah. Um, in defence of the leftists, though, mm-hmm. um, there are times. So, so then the next step would be to say something like, if you just have a free market for it, you'll get the best best possible outcome because it'll it'll increase the number of houses that are available for rental. Sure, I wouldn't um, say that. To be clear, though, I'm not a I'm not a free market uh, yeah. fetishist or whatever. Yeah, I, w- I would never say that. But I understand. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to then ask you what. So, in defence of the leftist people, what, what would you say about a um, about having controls on wages, having minimum wages, because minimum wages seem to me to be a rather similar kind of policy prescription to rent control. Someone could say, well, you're going to end up with more unemployment, so you shouldn't have a minimum wage. So I just wondered what your reaction to that would be. I think that when you're making economic policy and we're looking at the effects of economic policy, um, I think that it's good to use morality to determine what effects we want, but then then you leave the morality at the door and we just look at the at the, at the data. Um, so, for instance, in the United States, it seems to be the case, from what I've seen, that the slight increases in minimum wage 
um, aren't causing like a spike in unemployment. It doesn't seem to be happening. Now, there's a couple of smaller experiments in parts of the United States where they've done a significant bump in minimum wage, and people are still contesting the the, the effects of that back and forth. But like when we when we talk about like giving a minimum wage to people, I think the important thing is to recognize like we don't want like the the end goal isn't just have people paid more. The end goal is we want somebody to be able to work a job and be able to provide their for their family. You know, given they're working a certain amount, you shouldn't work forty hours a week and not even be able to afford you know like a place to live. Um, so sometimes I think it's good to recognize that like if this policy doesn't work, let's say minimum wage is bad. What's something we can do that does work rather than just insisting over and over again that this policy must work, even if all the empirical data says otherwise. Okay, look, look, I do, I do agree with you that it is important to keep description and prescription separately. And I think that mm -hmm. um, taking account of the way things actually work is really important for achieving good ends. Sure. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, but, I understand. Um, but on the other hand, I'm a bit suspicious of the idea that the wage structure in the economy is something that you know, really is just determined by all the markets. So I think you could have probably quite a different wage structure in, in most economies mm -hmm. and and end up with full employment. I think that there's a lot of things that determine wage structures. And I think if they're um, changed a little bit, mm -hmm. um, then you might be able to do other things uh, to encourage, yeah, to get full employment. So there are some there are some job schemes in India and so on where um, the government guarantees people a certain amount of work mm -hmm. um, for farm workers and things like that. Um, so there are things you can do apart from just working on wages. Sure. I guess I'd say. And those are things that, like, um, if, if somebody ever has like a plan for that, I would love to to see that type of stuff. Are you are you familiar with Mondragon? No, nope. uh, it's a, it's a federation of co-ops in France that um, a lot of left-leaning people like to point to as an example of co-ops working. Like if people think that co-ops are effective ways of organizing labor such that everybody gets paid and there's not a as a disproportionate distribution of wages in a particular company, um, I would love to see like a program in the United States that gives preferential loans, maybe low interest loans to people that want to start co-ops. And then, oh, I'm sorry, not in France, in Spain. Um, and then you start running that experiment over the course of maybe 10, 20 years and you see the impacts of like, okay, well, these people started co-ops here the outcome for the workers, et cetera, like stuff like that, I think would be really cool for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 It's probably I mean, important not to get lost thinking that like the economy can only work one way and that any other way is inconceivable. That, that's probably bad. I would agree with that for sure. There are different countries that have similar unemployment rates that have very different distributions of wages. So mm -hmm. I think Australia, um, which I obviously know a bit better, is, uh, is a country that has um, before tax and transfers has quite a an unequal distribution of income, but after taxes and transfers, it's much more equal. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think you can do quite a bit with with taxes and transfers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, you were referring earlier to the phenomena of the working poor. I guess, do you think that's a really big thing in the US? Um, it seems to be right now. Yeah. Or what do you mean by a big thing? Like people care about it, or it's a descriptive reality? Um, well, both, really. Yeah, well, I mean, people care about it. Um, it seems to be the case. Uh, if, if you don't mind me asking, I, I don't know how um, secretive you are. What's like your ballpark for age? Like, I'm 31 years old. I'm 57. Okay, you're 57. Okay. Um, I, so I don't know if it was like this in Australia, but like what, what it felt like for me was if you're in your 50s or 60s, growing up, you were able to get a full-time job, one man— I'm being very sexy here, but like one man generally would provide for an entire family of four and get like a pension off of his like one job. You either had like a, like you could get like a union job or you could just get a good job that had a pension, a good 401k, and that one person could, could provide for three other people living with them. And that that was insane. Um, nowadays, even with two people working, sometimes it can be a struggle to provide for a full family of four. Um, it feels like the quality of work in terms of compensation ha has decreased. Um, and it seems like the... Um, like how long you're able to work a particular job and then how you're compensated for at the end, like in the form of pensions or whatever, that all of that is like almost unheard of these days com compared to what it was, um, I, I guess for, I, I guess we'd say for the boomers or for Gen X, I think is the generation after. Yeah, the statistic I've heard is that um, um, up until now, you could pretty much be certain that your kids would be economically more prosperous than you. But I've heard that in the US, mm -hmm. um, people that... Um, started since the 1980s mm -hmm. it's been the case that that that's more and more tenuous that you know it's less and less likely that your kids will be better off than you and obviously people are, are pretty upset about that yeah 
Yeah, and I think it's not even necessarily like one thing you'd have to be careful of, um, not you in particular, but just like that you'd have to be careful of in measuring these stats is it like it might be that um, this is just a hypothetical. I don't know if this turned out, but it might be that um, children today are more economically prosperous than their parents, but maybe that comes on the back of not moving out until you're 27 on average or something. Um, like I know, for instance, across Europe and I think in the United States, the age at which children move out has increased over and over and over again. Um, and it might be that somebody might might feel that, um, you know, my parents were more free because they could move out at 18 and work um, than a person that has to stay with their parents until they're 26, even if they might earn more money at that point because it felt like, um, yeah, like they didn't have the same type of freedom that their parents did, um, even if they technically had a better economic outcome. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I mean, I, when I think about all this stuff and I think about what governments can do and what they can't do about these kinds of problems, mm -hmm. um, there's been a really big change in the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, the share of government spending uh, government spending as a share of GDP was quite low, and then it basically rose to being about half the economy um, over the 20th century. And, uh, you know, there's regional differences. The, the U.S. is a bit lower than Europe, and Europe has more developed social services, but it's still about a half. Sure. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's testimony to the fact that the economic system we have is kind of like social Darwinism unless there's quite a lot of government involvement. Mm -hmm. um there really is yeah there's a lot of stuff that government can do yeah yeah it feel, without like I, I don't have like the most diverse <laughs> economics background i'm a music school dropout uh, I, I guess it, it, the feeling to me the general feeling i get is that like over the past hundred or so years like capital has gotten so much more productive and owning capital has gotten so much more productive that that gap between being a worker and an owner has just it magnified so much and then how large companies get as well like plays into that um too that if you're the owner of a multinational company you're necessarily going to be orders of magnitude removed in terms of income from like your lowest level worker and that today that like owning certain types of capital like owning a factory a car factory you know in the 1940s is probably whatever you have to staff that with hundreds or thousands of workers but owning a car factory today maybe you only need less than 100 engineers to run it you know yeah Yes, yes, that's right. And that this is really interesting, uh, Destiny, because it's one of the things, you know, economic de the basic fact of economic development is that labor becomes more productive. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot of really interesting social impacts. So one of the things about it is that when you're comparing spending time at work versus spending time on unpaid activities, like whether that's spending time with your family whether it's time for recycling or environmental concerns or whatever it is, mm -hmm. the fact that your labor is much more productive as, as you know, capitals become much more productive means that um, people are going to be drawn away from those other activities. So it's not just um, families that have suffered from economic development. It's also all kinds of other activities like environmental concerns. I mean, think of repairing. Repairing used to be something that people would do but, you know, it just doesn't make sense economically now because your wage is so so valuable. Wait, what do you, so what do you mean when you, say, of, when you say repairing? What do you mean by that? Well, you think about if you've got something that um, you could fix uh -huh. um, that goes wrong, um, it might take you a lot, a lot of time to do it. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm trying to manage my time so that I can spend more time at the office. I can earn oh, okay, my okay. way. Gotcha. I mean, that was the original. That was so one of the original arguments about how economic development changed families was by Gary Becker. And he said that as the female wage rose, mm -hmm. women would compare the time at home with the time in the workplace. And as the time in the workplace became more and more valuable in terms of what you could get with it, um, they left the home and, and began to work. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's had all sorts of good, um, good outcomes. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. But Going back to your thing about descriptive reality, that is, that is what happened. And in a similar sort of way, um, increasing wages have had have drained time away from all sorts of other activities, not just child rearing. So, sure. yeah, the, the world's an interesting place because of capital. Because yeah. of the because yeah. of just that's that's the main thing about economic development: that wages become uh, higher and higher as you go through time. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, you know, there's anything else I wanted to ask you? What do you, um, as a professor, do you have to teach, or can you just do research, or? Yeah, so um, so you have to do you have to split between teaching and research, and I really I really like teaching. Um, 
I'm I'm pretty good at it, and uh, and I enjoy having discussions with students. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I'll, I'll I'll try something out on you, um, oh. which is one of my favorite one of my yeah it's one of my favorite classes. Okay. So there was a um, there was an article which said that um, the way that we could address global warming mm-hmm. is to genetically modify people so they were half the size and didn't eat meat. Now apparently this is all feasible to do. You can breed people so they get shorter and shorter, and you can uh, put meat patches on and things like that so they don't like meat. Okay. And so I asked my students who supported this, and uh, as a compulsory policy, and and you know no surprises, nobody supported it. Mm-hmm. So then I asked people, um, you agree with breeding animals? Why don't you agree with? So I asked. Sorry, I asked people, how many of you agree with breeding animals? Uh-huh. And about half them say it's okay to breed animals so long as there's no cruelty involved Mm -hmm. and so i ask them how come you're okay about breeding animals but you're not okay about breeding humans for such a good cause as as getting rid of global warming because of course your global footprints um your global footprint your environmental footprint i'm sorry is related to your size so if you're half the size and you don't eat meat that would have a huge impact on global warming Sure. If, if everybody in the world was like that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's a really interesting discussion because they can't generally give me a good reason. So I just put it to them that they think that people are more valuable than animals and, and they agree with that. Mm-hmm. And then, then I ask them why. And I basically get three kinds of answers. Uh-huh. So the first, the first answer is a religious or a spiritual answer that people are a special creation from God and so they have dignity because of that. Uh, They're different to animals, although they are an animal, they're a special animal. Mm -hmm. Another answer is that um, it's just an illusion. We're not really more valuable than animals. And the third answer is that we're more valuable than animals because of our capabilities. So, um, yeah, we're just more you know, we're more dexterous, we're more intelligent, more able to experience depth of relationships than, as far as we know, than animals are. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I find that I find that really interesting. It's related to democracy too, because um, everybody. One of the things I like about democracy is everybody gets the same vote, yeah. and it's kind of an expression of the inherent quality of people, at least at the moment of voting. Just, yeah, to some extent, and. Um, yeah, yeah. So I wonder what you thought about that. Would would you say that people are more valuable than animals? Um, <laughs> this is a conversation that we've had a lot on, on my um on my platform. Um, oh, sorry. if it's boring, just move. Oh on no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It means at least I, I don't have to. Um, I, I like I have all my responses prepared. I guess. So the so I would answer that yes, we value people uh, greater than animals for sure. Absolutely. That's not an answer. Do you value people more than animals? Yeah, I value people more than animals. Absolutely, for sure. Why? Um, so the foundational way that I view my world is that I try to prescribe a set of actions that maximizes the experience that I can have on this planet. And, um, when I look at how animals are treated, um, there is zero repercussion for eating animals. There's just not, there will never, ever, ever be like an, an animal uprising or an animal revolution or something where, you know, these types of creatures will organize and destroy all of mankind. So there's literally no downside to animal agriculture, unless we get into like environmental effects in which you could say, okay, well maybe we shouldn't do this. Um, but that's why I have like a fundamentally different view uh, of my interactions with people versus interactions with animals. Oh, so is it, let me just try and understand it. It's like, mm-hmm. It's like if you try to treat people that way, they might bite back. You you might have a revolution on your hands. They might almost they might Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right. So that um, yeah. yeah, that's a new answer. I haven't heard that one before. That's it. Well, um, I think in my opinion, that is the only answer you can give to remain um, to be consistent on your views of animal and people. Almost every other answer fails very hard on multiple levels for other types of tests. Yeah. Unless, uh, unless you think you've heard, well, you could give a religious answer that humans are a kind of thing created and that animals were put here with the purpose of being consumed. So there is no moral wrong being committed by manipulating animals for consumption. But we shouldn't do the same for humans because that's like a, a misuse of, you're playing God literally. Yeah? 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That would be another answer. Um, the one response about how there are different traits that humans have versus animals, um, that's a really common trap to fall into because as soon as you start asking, you know, well, what is some trait that humans possess, that all humans possess, that no animals possess, that make them worth um, not or make them unworthy of moral consideration, you'll never find a particular thing that all humans have that all animals don't have. That's like an impossible bar to pass. You know, if you start saying, well, humans can form relationships, tons of animals can form relationships. You're talking about levels of intelligence, tons of animals have certain levels of intelligence, um, and then you you have to look at the lowest kinds of people that exist that's a really bad way of saying that but like um you know like are you okay with destroying humans below like a certain intellectual threshold or something yeah going down that path i think is really bad usually okay now that's that's okay that's where i end up so mm -hmm. so where i end up with this with this class is i i think that most people find it hard to say it's an illusion that people are more valuable than animals but we we really believe it it's we like believing to, yeah. something that that is false. And that's that's kind of a hard thing to do. So most people default to something like human capabilities make us more valuable than animals. But then the question is, if capabilities is, what's crea is what creates value across species, then what about within species? Yeah. Doesn't that imply that some people are more valuable than others? Yeah. And indeed, people in certain situations, like really seriously ill people, might be less conscious than animals or less dexterous than animals yeah should we be able to and farm so, senior citizens and eat people in retirement homes if you're going to go down that route because you'd almost have to say yes to that to remain consistent in your answer that's right that's right mm -hmm. but your answer is interesting so let me just make sure i understand that you're saying that because i couldn't get away with farming people or breeding people but i can get away with farming animals then then that's that's okay yeah basically yeah if you could get away with farming people or breeding people, like you're a dictator or something, would it be okay? Um, so... Uh, so, the, so these type of hypotheticals are, are dangerous to get into. So the answer to that, I would say, is yes. Um, but like with with the with the asterisk that like it seems impossible or inconceivable that we could have a world where that would work, um, because as it's been happening in the past, one, it's usually um, economically disadvantageous. Um, I, I've seen a couple of really interesting papers that say that, like the South's economy was actually held back to some extent in the United States um, because of um, uh, because of um, uh, because of slavery, for instance. Um, and then it seems like slavery isn't a very tenable system that over time that leads to a lot of instability that causes uprisings that messes everything up. So I don't think I'd want to be in that type of society. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, are you familiar with um, uh, the, oh my God, um, is it Rawls, Theory of Justice, the the curtain? Yeah. yeah. Um, the idea that like, um, if I'm creating a society and I'm making prescriptions, um, I need my neighbor to be as invested in my outcome as I am in his in, in, in as invested in my outcome as I am in his outcome. So it seems to be the case that I should probably be um, deferential to other people. Like I'll do things that I think makes your life better because I expect the same from you. And if I don't act in that way, I shouldn't expect anybody else to act in that way also so if i endorse any type of society where i'm like hey you know you know maybe we should just enslave you know tons of people or whatever um it seems to be the case that i might be on the receiving end of that someday and i might have like you know in some way created my own downfall um in, in, a, in a very abstract way of thinking yeah well, that's really interesting I, I let me make sure i've, I've got you here yeah. so you're talking about Rawls' theory of justice his idea of the veil of ignorance yeah. which is that you, you imagine the kind of you imagine you do the thought experiment of if I could end up anywhere and and I didn't know where that would be, what kind of a society would I like? And then you design society according to that. Mm -hmm. um, I've always found that a really interesting theory because um, so so forgive me saying something as a Christian here, but yeah. at least at least basing your ethics on Christianity, at least you're basing it on something that might be true. Mm -hmm. um, I think actually you have good reason for thinking it's true, but let's let's leave that aside. Sure. But rules are fascinating because rules' theory of justice is based on something we all know isn't true. We don't live in such a world where where we could end up anywhere in the kind of thought experiment that he's talking about. I mean, you could say that you never know what'll happen to you, and look, that's 
that's kind of true, but we can all insure ourselves. Some people can insure themselves against bad outcomes a lot more than others. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem to me that rules justice, rules theory of justice, really makes sense. It's 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 like saying um, we should all act in such a way as that when Santa Claus comes, he'll he'll be good to us because we've been good. It's based on a thought experiment, which you know is false. Well, so I understand what you're saying there. Um, so to to for, to make this personal to me. I am essentially living in, because I'm pretty wealthy, I'm pretty white, I'm pretty male, um, I could be like anti-LGBT or anti-minority rights, and none of these at the end of the day really have much of an impact on me. I'm pretty insulated from those types of things in society because of my class, I guess. Um, I think I think to some extent that's true. Um, earlier you mentioned uh, utilitarianism, right? Yeah. Have you ever heard of a distinction between act and rural utilitarianism? Yeah, I've did you, oh, sorry, do you want to? Do you want to just say what? Yes, I oh, have. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, okay. that is for. The, yeah, for my for my understanding of it, right? Um, so I, I think um, I think an act utilitarian is somebody that looks at every circumstance. So an act utilitarian might say we should kill one person in a hospital and harvest their organs and give it to five other people because if we just look at that act, you know, it maximizes the outcome for that particular scenario. Um, whereas I believe a rural utilitarian might say, well, if we have a rule for society where we are murdering people to go to the hospital, the overall outcome of that is actually negative. Even if in a particular act, you might get an increase in, in utility. Um, and, and if you implement that as an overall rule for society, you get a, a net decrease in utility because now nobody goes to hospital nobody trusts doctors it ends up really bad yes. um yeah so I, so i consider myself that the normative framework that i use is rural utilitarianism so what i try to think of is if i'm making prescriptions for other people what are broad rules that i feel like everybody in society could follow that would lead to creating a society that's better for everybody else um, and then that's the framework through which i try to make um, either policy recommendations or prescriptions or moral prescriptions so personally i try to act in such a way that like okay if anybody else did this to me would i be okay i'll treat everybody in this way and expect the same in return um, and then from a policy point of view i try to think like okay well if anybody in society is in a particular position it's probably good if we maximize the outcomes for everybody because then everybody else is more invested in maximizing the outcomes for everybody else so one realistic way that this might um, influence like a like a like a person's life or whatever um, let's say that you live like in a wealthy part of the city or whatever and there's like an impoverished part of the city you know and one end you might be like okay well screw those people you know they all they all kill each other do drugs i don't care but in another end um you know if you enact a certain level of policy programs policy programs a, a certain amount of policies that improve that side of the of the neighborhood or that side of the town or i should say or whatever um like there are a few things that we can acknowledge. One is that whatever taxes you take from the really wealthy people are probably going to have a greater impact on the other people, right? Because of the marginal um, utility of a dollar. Um, and that two, those people becoming successful might open up more personal avenues to you. Maybe you've got more customers to sell a product to. Maybe you've got more friends you can make. Maybe you've got um, less spending you have to do on the police uh, or other emergency services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from, from that like broad, you, like that rule utilitarian, like normative system, I kind of broadly apply that view to the world. Um, and I feel like that's the most, I, I feel like I can consistently generate decent answers about how everybody should act. And then I try to act in the same way, because if I didn't, then it seems like it would be pretty empty for me to say that. Okay. That, sorry. That was a lot. Did that make sense? It's kind of the, the way that I view yeah, the world. No, no, it does make sense. Is, mm -hmm. is pretty, very clear. Okay. Um, and Kant, Kant said, this, said a similar sort of thing. He said, you should believe in uh, acting in such a way that it can be generalized. So yeah. you know, what happens if everybody does this? So, sure, categorical uh, imperatives and everything. Yeah, the, the universal. Right, right. Simil similar idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all those things, um, I think that they justify pre-existing moral intuitions that already exist, namely that you ought to be fair to people mm -hmm. and you ought to... Uh, be kind and compassionate to people, and then these these kinds of um, uh, frameworks or or thought experiments or, or sort of explain that. But I don't think that they're really fundamental. I think that I think that you well, I guess I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I can't prejudge, but I guess that you have some kind of moral intuition that you ought to be fair to people and compassionate to people. Yeah. So <laughs> the thing that I get really careful about here is. Um, um, are you familiar with the term metaethics? 
Okay, I don't. I hate meta ethics. I don't believe in any of that. <laughs> okay, um, but the the way that I view it is basically like um, I I don't investigate meta ethics at all. Um, I so I, what the, the statement that I use is that people all seem to have these preferences that they try to satisfy um like seems like people want food and water seems like people want friends seems like people want you know to do certain things in society and that all i do is i i seek through my normative lens is to try to maximize those preferences now some people will go stronger than that and they'll say well those preferences are actually moral intuitions and and you know actually you know these types of um, intuitions that people have um you, you can be a virtue ethic whatever you like point towards some sort of like moral fact or moral truth i'm not comfortable making statements that that strong. Um, I, I usually just ended up saying like, well, it seems like everybody prefers a certain thing. Um, I just won't go a step farther and say, well, these must be morals. It must be pointing towards some moral fact. So there's some underlying reality that shows that, you know, moral truth is a real thing and that we can actually, you know, perceive it or something. Yeah. Is that because that would get you um, dangerously close to theism? Because then you'd be asking, where do those moral facts come from? Um, well, I mean, we could say that moral facts are a feature of the world that don't necessarily require greater power. Um, the reason the reason why I don't uh, think about those things is because I don't like to consider things that have, there's no way to say if they're right or wrong. Um, like, yeah, I, I just, I don't believe there's a good way to test for moral fact. Um, I don't believe there's a good way to predict like a, like a moral fact. If two people, um, the reason why I think this is important is because if two people have a disagreement over moral fact, I don't think those disagreements can ever be settled. So I don't think it's worth investigating. That's how I view it, yeah. Um, do you kind of make a distinction between facts that you can discover with science and moral stuff and values that you can't? Um, kind of. Well, yeah, the distinction is that I don't, I don't usually think about like, yeah, morality or like moral fact. They're, these are things I don't usually consider. So like if I'm talking about a situation, I try not to say like, this is good or this is evil or whatever, for instance, like I don't usually use words like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in this because um, I guess um, you would be aware of the kind of drift in society over the 20th century where people became less comfortable with the kind of view that says that we've got science over here that can prove stuff and then there's ethics and values and religion over here which are, you know, unprovable. Mm -hmm. So the, the classic statement of that was... Um, have you heard of logical positivism? Um, oh, God, I have, I, but I don't remember it. Can you refresh me? Yeah, sure. So this is really this is a really crude way of putting it, but I did mm -hmm. check it with a philosopher at Oxford once, so it's sort of good enough. Okay. Um, log <laughs> logical positivism is the idea that the only thing that you can know that's – the only way you can know something is true mm -hmm. is through experiments or mathematical reasoning. Okay. So – and that was a very popular view of, um, of philosophy in the early 20th century. And then somebody unkindly asked whether that statement that I just made is provable by mathematics or scientific experiments. And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. And so the position collapsed. Um, okay. So <laughs> that's why, um, in fact, the lead philosopher gave it up um, in his lifetime, which is pretty rare for philosophy. It's pretty rare for something to appear and then and then vanish uh, kind of quickly. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I was just, um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily make such a distinction between the things that we can argue about and know are true and, and then the morals, religion and stuff on the other side, which, which you know, you really can't know about. Yeah, I don't I think the distinction... Well, the thing that bothers me, I guess, is that like I want to be able to I want to be able to tell somebody that they should do something. Um, when we talk about like policies in the United States, I want to say like you should pay your taxes or you should be able to do this. Um, and, and I feel like starting from a framework that requires you to buy into um, some sort of theological position kind of robs me of the ability to convince. Because, again, if there's like a disagreement over moral fact, then it seems like you're you're incapable of resolving like a dispute related to like a moral fact. It, it, yeah, that's, I guess that's my big problem with it that I'm not comfortable with. I'm not sure I understand that. Can we just go through that again slowly? You said that you want to be able to tell people that they should do something. Now, should's a moral, a moral imperative. Yeah. You want to, you want to, as it were, um, appeal to a moral imperative. Yeah, sure. And then, yep. Yeah, and then, um, and then you said, then, then just help me with the rest of the argument. Um, 
that it, it seems like if if you should start from like moral fact and the other person has a disagreement on moral fact that you're robbed of the ability to make any argument you can never convince them that they ought to do a particular thing do you think you should be making statements of moral imperatives if you don't believe in moral facts um yeah some type of imperatives maybe i would have just called them normative i'm not sure um but um yeah, I mean, I, 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 appealing to like that, that like the, the idea that most people have preferences, that most people um, are trying to satisfy said preferences, and that if most people do satisfy said preferences, it usually results in a better net outcome for everybody involved. Yeah, is, is usually what. So I usually what I try to do is I try to argue to the other person that it's actually in your self-interest to adopt this position um, is usually the, the, the way that I try to argue a particular thing. Okay, okay, interesting. Interesting. Well, what's the biggest policy change you'd make in the United States if you were king? Not that you agree with. Well, maybe you agree with being king. I don't know. No, I don't like <laughs> um, the, Oh, man, I don't even know. The biggest policy change? Oh, you seem very passionate about about policy change. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the biggest one would be. Um, I mean, like, I, um, maybe start... Um, I don't want the first answer I give to seem like it's the most important thing to me. It seems like universal health care is, the, is the one of the no-brainers. Um, every other Western country in the world, save for, I think, like Switzerland, has some form of universal health coverage. The United States should have it. Like, that seems to be a thing that we're, we're way behind on. So I, some form of universal health coverage would probably be where I'd start. Um, okay. Yeah, from a, from a domestic policy point of view, from a foreign policy point of view, um, I, I mean, there's a million things you go into there related to Iran or... Anything like that, or the Paris Climate Agreement, I guess. Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say like domestically, I would say like universal health care is probably where I'd start. Um, something related to, yeah, no, yeah, I'd start there. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, there. Oh, get rid of the war on drugs. That's a big one as well. Changing the way that we classify drugs and how we criminalize all of that would probably be the second thing. Those are like the two like really obvious things I think that need to dramatically change in the U.S. that have a lot of negative impacts, like far-reaching negative impacts. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, the universal health care is a, something that... Um, it's kind of easy to discuss across countries. It's pretty hard for me to discuss U.S. foreign policy as an outsider because, I mean, the U.S. is in such a unique position. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's amazing that the U.S. doesn't have universal health care. Yeah, so um, do some of us. <laughs> yeah. How, how, come, how come it doesn't? I mean, it must be a political choice because if the political will was there, it would happen. Um, what's going on? This is a hard one to answer and probably requires a lot of history that I don't have. My, the, the general feeling I get, the difference, like one of the big differences between Americans and Europeans, I'd say, and maybe Australians as a result, I'm not sure, is I think that it feels to me like Americans have a fundamental distrust of government. That government should absolutely be as small as possible. Anytime the government does something, it's horrible and bad, and it's literally like a last resort, like, oh, God, we have to have the government do it. That That's like an American's fundamental position on anything related to the government. Was um, that Ronald Reagan wrote quote, wasn't it? The most terrifying words anyone can ever hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, yeah as to an American, that would be absolutely true. Everything, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say like more specifically, um, I think America has a strong history of localization, of being very regional, um, that like you belong to a neighborhood, you might belong to a parish, you might belong to a union, that like being in these little groups, it's expected that the only thing the government ought to do is provide you with the tools to take care of yourself. That's it. And then it's a family's job, it's a community's job to take care of itself. Um, I think that these are like very fundamental ideas that have a strong history in america um and that as a result of that when you ask things like like if you ask like a republican american like a conservative like you know well, should the government do health care the first thing their minds went through is like okay the government is going to mess it all up because it's a big bureaucratic system that's horrible um you know we should be able to do this for ourselves i don't need the government to take care of me and you know if i become dependent on the government you know they could do all sorts of horrible things to me right you'll hear americans make this argument when it comes to guns we should have guns because we want to be able to fight back against the government someday i think that that rift is very alive um, and very strong. In, in that's, the, that's, an extraordinary, yeah. that's an extraordinary level of mistrust, isn't it, to say that we need to have guns to fight against the government? Yeah, but that's that's a legitimate feeling that a lot of right-leaning Americans have. It's, it's something very present in American politics. Yeah. I heard historically too that um, the origin of employer-provided health benefits was that I think it was during the Second World War. I need to check this. Um, there was a shortage of manpower, and so firms had to compete with one another. And one of the things they started to do was to offer 
health benefits to their workers, and that sort of became an entrenched practice. Um, it's possible. It's pretty yeah. tough if you don't have a job. It's pretty tough if you don't have a job. Yeah. What do you reckon about the um, the? I mean, it's called communitarianism. This idea that um, governments are in some sense taking over communities or stepping on them and, and the community should somehow step up for this kind of thing. Uh, it's a view from the outside, so I could be, mm-hmm. all my concepts could be wrong here. Um, this, so I have to wrestle with a lot of this because I, because I view this so differently than so many people. Um, so this is something that I've been learning a lot about over the past, actually over the past just a few months. Um, I, I'm not a very regional person. I'm a very worldly person. And I don't mean that in a good way. Just like I care about like world yeah. issues and like uh, international yeah, I issues. Yeah. I don't really care about like local. Like I lived in one place for 30 years and I moved to, I don't care about either of these places. I, I could go, I don't care. Um, now, but, but I'm I think. Pretty that, much the same, right? What? I'm pretty much the same. Okay. I have a very international outlook. Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay. Um, however, that seems to be not that seems to be a fringe position the more that i look at it um it seems to be that people actually were very happy when they were invested in their communities that when people went to town halls or union meetings or their local church communities that like people want to have a feeling that they belong to a community and that they have like a uh, influence over that community they know the guy they know the pastor that gives the sermons to their neighborhood or their parish like every week um that they are they they've seen the the mayor you know sometimes he's down at the local bar or whatever um, people want to feel that involvement. And when you have a a stronger central government, um, even though from an outcomes perspective, I would argue stronger central governments are superior in every way to a whole bunch of disconnected and fragmented smaller governments, it seems like people prefer to live in a society where they don't have a big... Um, a big bureaucratic, you know, faceless government coming in and telling them, you know, how they ought to conduct their business, that they want to feel like they have more control over their own particular um, communities. That seems to be a feeling that people have. Even with Brexit, people kind of echoed that, um, however dumb it may have been, that they didn't want to feel like people over in Brussels were telling them whether or not they could fish in a particular part of the sea or whatever. Yeah. I'm kind of torn about this personally, a bit of, a bit of, um, personal history here is I can understand, uh, particularly with families, actually, I can understand people saying that they would like a lot of their care and connection with people to come fundamentally through their family and their extended family. Mm-hmm. And look, as a Christian, I actually have sympathy with that because I think the family is a God-ordained thing. Mm-hmm. However, I've experienced when I was growing up an extremely dysfunctional family, which just didn't run the way that it should. Mm -hmm. And so I do understand that that's just not a reality for some people. And so I think that sometimes the government does have to step in. I mean, it is a bit, uh, you said good, you said big governments better in every way. Do you ever experience like feeling like you're a number in a bureaucracy as opposed to a known person in a group of friends? It is a bit different, isn't it? Um, I, I don't mean this um, in an insulting manner towards these types of people. I don't know. I might be somewhat autistic or whatever, uh, but I tend to view things through a very like quantitative lens. Um, so, I mean, I do to some extent, like I guess see myself as a number as like part of a federal system or whatever, but that doesn't bother me. I'm okay with that. Um, like realistically, I don't know if there's like any other way to deal with like large amounts of people than through like, you know, these kind of quantitative frameworks. Yeah. Okay, I view myself through a quantitative lens. But well, or like I understand, like I don't feel like I need to be something special or whatever to like a federal body. Like I wouldn't expect that. I'm not like the type of meaning that I enjoy in my life, where I feel like fulfilled. I, I wouldn't expect that to come from government. I guess so. I don't care if I'm treated as a number or part of a cog, in, or a cog in like part of a larger system or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. It doesn't. It doesn't feel uncomfortable for you to be a number. You kind of accept that that's the way it has to be if you're dealing with a large bureaucracy. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I can't think of anything else to talk about, um, Destiny. I've really enjoyed talking. Have you got anything else you want to ask me? Um, yeah, I'll hit you up with the one I have to ask. I'm super I'm super curious. Um, you don't have to tell me in terms of how you vote or whatever, but like how, um, the forest fire and stuff going on right now, um, or the, the yeah. forest fires going on in your country now, uh, it seems like the Liberal Party is under <laughs> quite a bit of attack. Um, do you have any, any thoughts or anything related to any of that or...? Um, look, well, I think, yeah, that's really interesting. That's a really interesting topic. Um, so I, I certainly believe in climate change. I think it's, I think what's, I think what's really difficult about it, is that a lot of people 
don't understand evidence-based reasoning. So the way evidence-based reasoning goes is you have a whole lot of data which you you kind of throw together with science, mm -hmm. and you can have an overwhelming case for something even though there's counterexamples. Yeah. So, for example, somebody can... Um, you might say that smoking causes cancer, but you know your uncle so-and-so who's been smoking all his life and he's just fine. Mm -hmm. and, and you can find a counterexample. But yeah. the statistical evidence that smoking causes cancer is overwhelmingly there. And uh, I think a lot of people find it hard to understand that. And I think maybe part of the problem is the way science is taught at school, because sometimes it's taught at school as though, you know, one experiment or one contrary example overturned everything. Yeah. And so people might get this idea that if there's one counterexample, they just throw everything out. Mm -hmm. And so, so unfortunately, um, you know, there are, climate change is based on um, science, which has all sorts of loose ends and unanswered questions. But I, I just think the the evidence is overwhelming that the CO2, CO2 levels have gone up, the temperature's gone up. It's obviously human caused and, um, you know, we should do something about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in Australia, well, gosh, um, what can I say? Um, except that I'm embarrassed. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a very difficult, um, well, it's just been very difficult to get political support for taking climate change seriously in Australia. Yeah. I guess it's because it's a large energy exporter. Um, and look, there's also, we are talking about ethics before, mm -hmm. there's also the kind of idea that if I can't personally make or break the solution for a problem, I don't have to do anything about it. It's like it's like a free rider problem. Yeah. And look, it's true that small countries, this isn't true for you guys in the US, but for small countries, it is true that, you know, what we do or don't do won't make a big difference. These things will be decided in Europe, US, China, and India. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But if if everybody adopts that, it's just really hard to get the problem solved. Yeah. If everybody yeah. takes a free rider approach, so I don't support that. Mm -hmm. But um, and look, I've got to I've got to accept some of the blame as an economist. I think economists have taught people to that individual rationality or country level rationality just means pursuing their own self interest. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. that's what happens when you do. It's really hard to get collective action solutions. Sorry, do you know what I mean by that? Um, it's really hard to get solutions that involve collective action when it's not in people's individual interests if they have the view that being rational just means pursuing their own interests. Yeah, it's like... Um... Yeah. Uh, uh, it's almost like a prisoner's dilemma, I think, where you always come out ahead if you screw over the other person. Yeah. Yeah, and then you end up with a bad outcome. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen there, but I think it's going to be. Um, I think it's it could well change the political culture, all the fires. I mean, it's it's just unbelievable. It's fine to talk about um, extreme weather events in theory, but when something like that happens, you know, you really see it. Yeah. So let's see if there's a change in policy. Yeah, one thing that I'm really curious about is that um, as weather events, it, it, the first the first event that I say really curious that sounds very morbid, but like um, if certain places on the planet start to become inhabitable, I wonder if people will change. I feel like I feel like climate you, change or inhabitable no? or uninhabitable. Uninhabitable. Wait, did I say inhabitable? Oh. Yes, you did. Oh, sorry. But the, uninhabitable. That's a, <laughs> Talk about that in a minute because that's really interesting too. <laughs> talk about oh places that will become ha habitable, inhabitable. That's right. Let's talk about the commercial advantages of the Arctic. Oh surface. God, who that was a Ben Shapiro tweet, I think. Did he say that? That like oh. oh look at all the new shipping routes that have opened up. Yeah, yikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I feel like climate on, change yeah. is the um, climate change is the ultimate killer of humans because of two problems. Um, one, the effects of, of pollution are never localized. Um, if I drive my car, I'm not breathing in the fumes directly. And two, um, the negative outcomes of pollution are always down the road. It's that delayed gratification thing. I think that those two things together are two things that humans intrinsically do not feel. We, just biologically, we're not wired to think about things that don't affect us directly, or at least our communities directly, and that have an impact really far down the road. Those are really hard for us to internally feel the consequences of, I think. That's a really good point. I mean, if I can just add a, a slight uh, note of optimism there. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things about 
one of the things about global warming is that um, just as the, the as you say the pollution is not localized it does have a nice implication which means that stopping the pollution it doesn't matter where that happens in the world mm -hmm. that that'll be effective so so that has a nice possibility if you could organize it if you had tradable rights to pollute um, if you had a system like that set up internationally then it means that you could cut pollution in the parts of the world where it was cheapest to do so. So the fact that um, the pollution is not localised is a really big problem. I agree with you completely. Mm -hmm. But it's also, um, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of interesting because you might be able to get around that with, uh, with tradable rights to pollute. Yeah, and Amer I don't know, have you ever heard of cap and trade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had right. we kind of have systems like that in America. I don't know if we're still doing those, but yeah, we had that idea that bit to tie some economic incentive in in place of polluting or not polluting. Yeah. yeah, I think that's actually one of the big contributions that economics has to climate change. The idea that if if everybody pays the same price to pollute, mm -hmm. and look, there's a lot of confusion about this debate, mm -hmm. which is that. You know, it's you have to have these massive debates about whether it should be a tax on pollution or whether it should be tradable rights, mm -hmm. to, which is the cap and trade system you mentioned a moment ago. Actually, that's not the main point. The main point is just that everybody pays the same price, whether whether you're paying it to government as a tax or whether you're paying it to somebody else as buying a right to pollute. All that matters is it's the same price because what that does is it means that people who find it easy to reduce pollution will do so. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you'll get pollution reduction at a minimum cost. Yeah. So there's enormous, enormous confusion about that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when people talk about the best way of dealing with climate change. What's the other thing you said? It was localised and you said, oh, delayed gratification. Yes, yeah. yes, that's right. that's right. Yeah, well, climate change is is a really big one. There's going to be, I, I was amazed to hear that, um, so one of the disadvantages of climate change, there's all sorts of strange things that will happen. One of them is that um, if the Himalayan ice cap melts or gets much smaller, mm -hmm. then the Bangladesh will have much more volatile water levels and flooding because the way that snow works is it just piles up during winter mm -hmm. and doesn't matter what, you know, if you have irregular snowfalls, it just builds up and then it melts gradually in spring and it kind of forms a steady water flow. Whereas if there's no ice there, then when it precipitates, the variability in precipitation just goes straight into the rivers. So people will have, you know, much more flooding. Mm -hmm. the, the, snow, the snow kind of smooths things out. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there's a lot of like unforeseen, like an insane number of impacts that will happen, yeah. like downstream from any of these things happening as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, great to talk. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks very much for um, for having me on. It's been uh, it's been what I hoped it would be, which is a discussion that sort of goes philosophical sometimes and then practical at other times. Yeah. Thanks a lot. If that um, you said uh, if that one student, I'm assuming she's a student of yours. If she ever brings up anything, if you ever disagree heavily with anything I say, yeah, it'd be interesting to get your feedback, or whatever, on anything. So. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk again then. All right. Cool. Um, I appreciate the conversation. Uh, do you have like like a? This is kind of weird as a professor. Do you have like a social media or anything that you like to plug or anything? Or I like to plug the book that I've written. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. What's the book that you've written? The book's called Western Fundamentalism. And if you want to get a hold of it, you just type into Google Gordon Menzies Western Fundamentalism, and uh, it's about the idea that uh, you don't have to be religious to be a fundamentalist. You can have deeply held ideas that you can't prove that you base your life on. And uh, religious people and non-religious people should be aware of those and should be prepared to talk about them. Um, okay. Cool. Um, Western fundamentalism. Democracy, yeah. sex, and the liberation of mankind. That's, I'm assuming. Right. Yep. Okay, gotcha. Right. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks, Destiny. Great to talk. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the conversation. Have a good one. Here is Sargon to tell you how far you should limit yourself sexually, the master of sex. <laughs>